But anyways, I'm Pastor Teresa. For those of you that are visiting us for the first time, welcome to New Hope Haleiwa. It is my honor and my joy to be able to give the, today's word this morning. And we are in the middle of our acts of kindness, not so random. And um, we're on our fourth week now, and so we're super excited. But before we jump into the notes, I wanted to start with a joke. I can't take credit for the joke, okay? So I got to give kudos to Pastor Mike and Pastor Lori, who actually put this message together. And it's a great message. I'm super excited to share it with you. So anytime there's a joke, you know that I didn't come up with the joke. Glenn told me the other day, she, he said, honey, I don't know what's funny. The joke or are you telling the joke? Because I don't, I don't, if you know me, I don't tell jokes, and half the time I don't get the jokes. But this one I got, okay? So I'm going to read you this joke. Ready? There's a man and a pig, okay? A guy, a guy driving a VW bug happened to be driving behind a truck full of pigs when suddenly one of the pigs fell out. So he pulled over and put the dazed pig in the seat next to him and sped up to catch up with the truck. Just then... A police officer spotted him speeding and pulled him over. Where are you going in such a hurry? And what are you doing with one pig in your car? Oh, sorry, officer. But you see, I was following a truck full of pigs when this one fell out. And I was trying to catch up with the truck to return him. Well, the truck is long gone. You're never going to catch that truck. So just take the pig to the zoo. Do you understand? Yes, sir. The next day, the officer sees the same guy in a VW with the same pig still sitting beside him. The officer pulls him over again and says, I thought I told you to take the pig to the zoo. And the man said, I did. And we had such a good time. Now I'm taking him to the beach. <laughs> Great joke, yeah? So that wasn't an act of kindness that was random. It was an intentional one, right? God is a God of love, and we've been learning about him as a God of love, a God that is compassionate, a God that is full of mercy, hope, and justice. Amen? Amen. The presence of God that resides in his church. Turn to your neighbor and say, we the church. <laughs> Turn to your other neighbor and say, God's presence is supposed to be inside you. Did you ever think that the church needs to do more to help people? Raise your hand. We all think that, right? Turn to your neighbor and say, you the church. <laughs> Turn to your other neighbor and say, you're supposed to be helping people. <laughs> okay, we can all laugh at that because if we were honest with ourselves, we would all agree we could help more people. Amen? Yeah. I am a pastor, been a pastor for 10 years now, and I, I'll be honest and I'll admit I'm kind of downright selfish at times. Like, I don't want to help people. I don't want to talk to people. I talk to people. I pray for people. I minister to people all the time. Sometimes when I'm going to Walmart, I like get my milk. I like go home. I don't want to minister to somebody in Walmart. I'll be honest about that. But that's my flesh. Can I get an amen? But if we are truly going to be the church and allow for God's presence to reside in us, how many of you will agree you can't, you're not supposed to turn that off? Right? In Pastor Mike's book, Lightning in a Bottle, he calls that staying vertical, right? We have a vertical connection to Abba Father, and we have a horizontal connection to people. If we stay vertical, then we'll never stop flowing out to people. And I find in those moments when I'm selfish and I don't want to talk story to people, and I'm just about getting my business done, I am not being vertical with God. I am 100% in my flesh as Teresa. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like that. Can I get an amen? And that's why we're here this morning. We're here to overcome that temptation to want to just come to church, pray, and pay. You know, you call, they say come to church, pray, and pay. You just give your money because you know you're supposed to give money to the church, right? When deep down inside, all you really want to do is play. And I think that here on the North Shore, it's probably even a greater challenge. When you're so cl close to the beach and it's beautiful and there's so much to do to play on the North Shore, Go get Matsumoto's. I mean, there's so many wonderful things to do on the North Shore. It's really easy to not want to come to church. And we're facing that challenge. Some days we have 100 people here. Some days we got 20. And I'm like, wow, the waves must be up today. Right? That's the only thing I could figure, right? But we're trying to overcome that. And we're trying to truly, during this season, learn how to be the church that 
holds the presence of God, holds the power of God, holds the compassion, the kindness, the mercy, the hope, and the justice of God, and is willingly giving that away. This series is about the church, all of us making a real difference in the world. We're going to be intentional. If you're not intentional, if you don't wake up in the morning being intentional, then you're never going to do anything. I was at a conference yesterday, and the greatest takeaway from the conference yesterday was be intentional about adding value to five people a day. Just wake up and say, I'm going to add value to five people today. I, I don't know how, well, how that's going to happen. Maybe you're going to compliment somebody because um, they have a beautiful smile. Or maybe you're going to compliment them because they gave you good customer service. Or maybe you're going to say, hey, you know, I noticed you have a lot of bags. Can I help you get your bags to your car? Whatever it is. But be intentional that before the sun goes down, I'm going to touch five different lives. Somehow, some way. And when we do that, we are being the light of Christ. Can I get an amen? We don't want to just be random. I just happen to fall upon it. No, wake up and be intentional. How am I going to share the goodness of God today with somebody else? What does our church to do to help the, the poor and the homeless? What is our church going to be doing to stop sex trafficking or to partner with people who are trying to stop sex trafficking? This holiday season, we want to discover how one simple act of kindness from you, from me, can completely transform a life. And it's not random. Why? Why is it not random? It's because we're learning that it is the Holy Spirit who leads you. The Holy Spirit is intentional. He's not random. He's not going to just say, eh, I feel like blessing somebody today. No, his, his nature is Christ's nature. His nature is always to act as Christ would have him act. He is the Spirit of Christ. And if that is on the inside of you, your nature will become like Christ. Can I get an amen? And wherever Jesus went, he was helping people. He wasn't just randomly doing it. It was just a part of his being. He saw a, a lame person, he brought healing. He saw a blind, blind man, he laid hands and said, no, I'll give you the power of sight to see, right? People were hungry. The disciples were like, no, 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 we need to hurry up and leave because all these people are coming, they're going to be hungry. And, and Jesus' nature is like, what are you talking about? We don't want to run away from the people. We want to meet the needs of the people. They're hungry, feed them. Well, how are we going to feed them? Go get what you have and feed them, right? And that's what we constantly see of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is going to lead you and I in the same way. How many of you, by their uplifting every hands, are already making plans for holidays? Oh, you guys are good. My, my, my family, we're, we're so excited. Giselle was gone for two weeks. She went to Indianapolis to do a marching band. And let's give them a hand. See, Vance knows how important this is. They were the very first Hawaii marching band to ever compete in a national tournament. Ever. And Milani Trojan Marching Band, they went up there and they represented. We got to watch it on TV and they, they did a great job. They didn't advance to the next um, level, but it, just the fact that they were there, it was on the TV, it was on the news, give them a hand. This is their first band from Hawaii that's ever competing nationally. That was a huge deal. But with Giselle being gone, we, it was kind of like a big empty hole in our house. I mean, even at times, Emmett would see a picture and he would point because he didn't understand why his sister was missing. So we decided that we would actually um, give her a gift. And her gift was that she would come home to a clean house. <laughs> and it was Misha's idea. Misha, Misha said, Mom, every time we leave, Giselle is always the one who makes sure that the house is clean when we come home. So let's make sure the house is clean when she comes home and let's put up the Christmas tree. Now, traditionally, I don't put up the Christmas tree until the day after Thanksgiving. When everybody else is doing Black Friday and being all mad and angry and very worldly and just like not very godly and fighting the traffic and the lines, we, we decide we're gonna, that's our day we're going to put up our Christmas tree. But we actually have our Christmas tree up already. So if you drive by the house, you'll see the lights. We didn't decorate it, but the tree is up. So we, we are already decorating our home and we haven't even hit Thanksgiving yet. They wanted to clear off my Thanksgiving decorations. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I draw the line there. My pumpkins are going to stay on that table till we eat our turkey. Then you could put Christmas there. And so we have half Christmas and half Thanksgiving. But we are all excited for the holiday season. And if you're not excited about the holiday season, we hope we can change that. It is good to know that no matter what is going around around, around us, going on around us, we can take time to pause 
during these holiday seasons and really appreciate our family and the blessings that we have. Thus, the season of Thanksgiving, which is why we did the Thanksgiving tree. And I thought that that was a great idea when Sister Dawn said, hey, why don't we do a Thanksgiving tree? I'm like, I've never done that. I, I think this is going to have to be a tradition for our church. Because as a worshiper, you enter into God's presence with Thanksgiving. How more glorious to enter into the church and see that tree there and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go stop and thank God for something at this tree. You don't have to do it once. You can do it every Sunday. You can do it two, three times in a Sunday. You can't ever overthink God. Can I get an amen? And so we're trying to cultivate hearts of giving thanks, which is our message today. Okay? Give thanks is an event that we do every um, Thanksgiving at Iliahi Elementary School. And it is designed so that we, the church, can go out and feed the um, less fortunate and the homeless. Because we don't just feed the homeless, we feed families that, that are in need. And so if you're, you're new and you're wondering, what is give thanks? I don't even know what that is. How can I get involved? Basically, we go down to the cafeteria as early as 4 o'clock in the morning and we prepare all of these Thanksgiving meals in like um, bento boxes. And then um, they, in teams, go drive out to all of the different places um, on the island. At times, they went all the way out to Waianae. They come out to the North Shore. They do Wahiwa. Anywhere where we know there's homeless people and we have drivers, we send drivers out with, with plates of food to go and deliver the food and hopefully be able to pray blessings over that person and express and communicate the love of God. So we're going to be doing that again this Thursday. If you're like me, this is the first Thanksgiving I'm ever going to have dinner at my house because every year we usually go to my in-law's house, but this is my first year, oh my gosh, since I don't know, maybe... 95 that I'm going to cook turkey. Pray for me. <laughs> I think my father is a little bit worried. So he's got my mom helping me now. He's like, she, what if she can't do all the fixings? Because he's all about the fixings. I'm like, the fixings are the easy part. It's the turkey. I don't want to mess up the turkey, right? And so I think, I think he's a little bit nervous, but he hasn't spoken those words to me. So pray for me that I can do this. It's been a long time since I cooked turkey. And you know, you can mess up turkey. And so... Um, for us as a family, we still want to participate and give thanks, but we're going to have to jet in as early as we can and jet right back out because I need all the time in the world to do Thanksgiving so that I'm not doing it stressed. Now, if I was an expert like some of you ladies in here, because I know you all know how to just throw them together, right? Then I, I could probably stay a little longer and give thanks and then know that I could get it done. But I know myself, I'm going to need to pace myself and go slow so that it can be a blessed experience. Because the worst case scenario is people come to my house and I'm just a pill. That wouldn't be very Thanksgiving-like, yeah? Um, so we will be there on Thursday to do Give Thanks. And I want to encourage you folks to jump in. Maybe that's going to be new for you. Come for an hour. Come for half an hour. And we're going to be there from 4 in the morning until I think 2 in the afternoon. So whatever fits your schedule, work it out. And if you don't see people from our congregation, that don't matter. We all want ohana. Can I get an amen? Just walk up to somebody and say, hey, my name is so-and-so. I'm from Haleiwa. Where are you from? And you'll make a new friend, okay? The corner, uh, there are studies out there in the market now that show us that people with thankful hearts actually um, live happier, healthier, longer, fuller lives, okay? As a matter of fact, they showed studies of people who went through some kind of trauma or they had surgery of some sort, and those people who had a thankful spirit and thankful heart, they actually re recovered twice as fast. So what we're learning about this morning in giving thanks is not only just supposed to be something that we do for the holidays, it's supposed to become a, a state of condition of your heart. So we don't want to just talk about giving thanks. We want to talk about how do we nurture a heart that gives thanks. And during this series, if I can recap for those of you that haven't been, have been tracking with us, in week one, we just basically talked about how acts of kindness, don't, they don't have to be random. They can be intentional. Um, then we spoke about um, in week two, um, Pastor Glenn, help me. In week two, we spoke about... Um, Okay, last week was getting free. Um, la well, okay, I don't know what the order is, but basically we talked about not being random. We talked about being free so that you can free others, right? And then um, we talked about um, who is your neighbor, okay? And we're supposed to love our God and love our neighbor, and the issue isn't really the loving the part. It, the issue is loving our neighbor 
Because if we go by God's definition, our neighbor is actually our enemy. Okay, so we learned about that. And then Glenn gave a powerful message last week about um, how to um, be a person of justice. And now this week, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 19. So if you have your Bibles, you can take them out. Um, but the story is actually in your notes as well. And the Bible speaks of a man who was very wealthy. He was a tax collector, but he wasn't just any tax collector. He, he was the head honcho. He was like the tax collector of all tax collectors. And he was elite tax collector, and his name is Zacchaeus. So we're going to share that story really fast, and then we're going to break it down, okay? Um, so if you want to follow along in your notes, it'll actually come up on the screen as well. I'm just going to read it to you because it's a little too long to read together. And it says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see it over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He was gone to be with the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and I, if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be true, a true son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. How many of you know this story? Okay, many of us know this story. As a matter of fact, if I bring the little children in from Children's Ark, they could all sing the song. I don't know if I know the song, so if you're here and you know the song, sing with me. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Okay, so everybody knows a little wee little man's song, right? Okay, and for some of us, it seems like a simple enough story, and at first glance, it looks like it's a simple story story of repentance and salvation. And if you're like me, you're thinking, okay, he gave out this money. How come Jesus said he was saved? Right? He didn't say, Lord, save me. I confess of my sins. You know, like what we lead people through. All he did was give back the money and he gave back four times to the people he robbed. And all of a sudden, Jesus' response to that was not, great job, you thankful and generous man. Jesus says, you're saved. To me, that was always weird. But I think what we're learning here is that Jesus said he was saved because he saw a change in the condition of his heart. Okay? And that's what we're going to unpack today. This story has much more to it than just salvation. If we look deeply, Jesus encountered Zacchaeus, and we know that when everyone who encountered Jesus, they should walk away not the same. Can I get an amen? Amen. If you have not radically changed, okay, maybe you haven't radically changed, but if you've encountered Jesus in some way, there should be something different about you. If you don't notice anything different about yourself and you're like, I don't, I'm the same person I was, I don't feel any different, then we want to pray for you. Because maybe you've said a prayer that came from here and it was just knowledge. But maybe what we need to do is make sure when we say that prayer, you understand and bring it from here. Because this is where God wants to change. God wants to change your heart. He wants to transform and renew your mind, yes. But most importantly, he wants to change your heart. Can I get an amen? The story teaches us, therefore, to nurture a heart of thanksgiving. Turn to your neighbor and say, we want to nurture a heart of thanksgiving. How do we nurture a heart of thanksgiving or how do we nurture a heart that gives thanks? Would you write in your notes, number one, encounter Jesus daily. In Luke chapter 19, verse 5, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Okay. Zacchaeus encounters Jesus as he is perched in the sycamore tree. But then he, he gets to encounter Jesus again as a guest in his home. It's simply not enough to encounter Jesus one time. That's why we are not a church that contends 
to just say one prayer and like be saved and then that's it. You're done. That is just supposed to be the entry level. Can I get an amen? There is so much more transforming and empowering and encountering that Jesus wants to do with his people. He doesn't want them to stop just at salvation. We must allow him to give us three things that he gave Zacchaeus. And I'm going to share those things with you, okay? When Jesus encountered Zacchaeus in his home, and I suspect that Jesus had just a normal conversation with him, and in that normal conversation, the goodness of the Lord reflected on the darkness of Zacchaeus' heart, and he begins to transform in the very midst of Jesus. So in this encounter, Jesus gave Zacchaeus a new appreciation. He gave Zacchaeus a new appreciation of who he is, Jesus, and he gave Zacchaeus a new appreciation of who he was. Before, this man was a despised man. He was like, they called him a sinner. Nobody liked him. Why? Because he was a tax collector. And most tax collectors were a very, um, they're like thieves. They were like corrupt. You know, sometimes we feel that way about our government, yeah? They take all our money. Um, but in that time, they really did steal the money. They would tax the people too highly so that they could take their cut. And so in, in that time, Zacchaeus was not a very liked person. He knew this. He knew that he was hated and despised. And here's Jesus, this good man who says, I'm going to come into your home. And not only does he get a new appreciation for who Jesus is, but he gets a new appreciation of himself, that he can see himself in a different light. Jesus didn't shun him. Jesus didn't treat him like the thief that he was, the corrupt co tax collector that he was. And that's what Jesus does for us. When Jesus comes and he tells us, I love you. Sometimes we have a hard time wrapping our head around that because we know what our past is. We know what our present is. We know our present condition. And yet he doesn't come to condemn us. He comes to save us, right? From everyone, Jesus recognizes him. Jesus gives this man Zacchaeus esteem. He doesn't make him feel untouchable or unloved. He doesn't despise him. He accepts him and makes him acceptable by entering into his home. He does that for us as well if we allow him to enter into our hearts. The second thing Jesus gave him was a new evaluation. The world through Zacchaeus' lenses is very small. Zacchaeus was, yes, a man small in stature, but he was equally as small in his character. He was a tax collector and he was selfish. All he was concerned about was getting his cut, making money for himself. Zacchaeus, now after encountering Jesus, is exposed to God's economy. He's exposed to God's heart and God's kingdom, and he begins to see what he thought was important is not what God sees as important. He begins to see as he encounters Jesus that, you know what, money, money isn't everything. There's so much more here. There's so much more that I'm missing. And so he begins to repent in his heart. He begins to become grateful in his heart because he now has a new evaluation of his own life. Prior to encountering Jesus, he was felt like he was normal. There's nothing wrong with me. You know what I mean? You, how, how many of you heard that phrase, you don't know what you don't know? Like if you don't know that you're a sinner, then you don't know that you're a sinner. You just think my life is good. But it's when we see Jesus and we see his measure of a man, his example of how you should live, his um, a measuring stick, if you will, of what should be a good life, now we compare ours to Jesus, and now we see that, yes, we fall short. But if you don't see that measurement of a man, if you don't see Jesus, if you don't encounter him, then you, you can live your whole life and not even know that something's wrong with you. And how many of you know there are people in the world that are like that? They have no clue that how they're living is wrong. Prior to me coming to Jesus, I had diarrhea of the mouth. Man, every other word in my mouth was cussing, I, like that was my primary language, was curse words. And it's because I grew up in the military, and that's all I ever heard. I woke up listening to my dad curse out the lawnmower every Saturday. And I'm, so to me, that was normal language, you know. 
But when I met Jesus, I realized that, he, that my mouth was not pleasing to the Lord. And I began to meditate and pray, Lord, may the words of my mouth be pleasing to you. Uh, may, uh, and then God would highlight to me how not pleasing my mouth was. So be careful what you pray with, you know, what you ask for. He's going to show you. And so once I encountered him, I realized my, this is not good. So I could surrender my mouth to God. And I could say, you know what, I, I don't want to be that person, God. I, I can't completely change my DNA and my past of the language that is gripped in my mouth but you can burn my mouth with stones and like you can change my language for me and slowly he did every once in a while I have to be careful because remember if you're honest with yourself do you believe that you are connected to Jesus 24 7 like are you constantly aware of his presence or are there times when you're walking in your flesh well all of us know there are times when we're walking in our flesh it's when you're walking in your flesh that you fall backwards to those old reels if you were an angry man and then you became a peaceful man, well, when you're walking your flesh, guess what? You're going to be angry. If you're a lustful man and then you became a pure man, well, if you go back into your flesh, you're going to become a lustful man again. Okay, so the key to our victory is staying connected vertically to Jesus all the time. Not even giving way to not walk in, the, in our flesh. Amen. And that is, e that is easier said than done. And I want to acknowledge that. So I'm not trying to minimize um, the struggle that we fa face with our, with our flesh. But the good news is someday we're not going to have flesh. Can I get an amen? <laughs> oh, I'm waiting for that day when I got my glorious body and I don't have no issues, man. And that's going to be a great victory day. Uh, so, but Z Zacchaeus now is starting to reevaluate himself. And he's starting to see things from a different pers perspective. So Jesus gave Zacchaeus a new appreciation. He gave him a new evaluation. And he gave him a new motivation. Okay, G Zacchaeus receives from Jesus... And he is so full of gratefulness. He feels so blessed by God's mercy and his kindness and his compassion. And his new um, eyes to see that he moves from a served heart to being a servant heart. He goes from being selfish to being self-giving. Zacchaeus is no longer operating in the same way he was with the same reasons. And he will do that for you. God will do that for you. If you're not a person that can give thanks and is not a heart, does not have a heart that nurtures thankfulness, God can change that. He can change that for you. It starts first by encountering Jesus daily. You got to come into his presence and give him thanks, right? Come into his presence. And when you behold the glory of God like we did this morning, you... You are filled with gratitude. You can't help but to, to profess it and to do something about it. Can I get an amen? How many of you have ever been blessed by somebody um, just randomly? Somebody blessed you. And so you just automatically, your response is, I want to do something good back to them. Okay? I remember one time, and this has is, this is completely changed my, like, my internal um, I don't know how to say it. Like something on the inside of me has forever been impacted and changed. Yeah, that's, maybe that's a good way of saying it. My internal compass has shifted a little bit. Um, and I, I've never been a person who has pursued wanting to be wealthy. I, I've never wanted that. Like I was telling Mr. Greg Ofeich over here, like I, all I need is for my kids to be grounded in Christ. I'm going to die a happy woman. I, I don't need too much. And it would be nice to just go visit horses every once in a while. I don't even need to own one. I just can go visit them. And, um, but one day, my husband and I, and we have a huge family, okay? We have a family of six. Uh, at the time, we had six. We have, we have a family of seven now. But at the time, we had a family of six, four teenagers, okay? And if you have teenagers, you know teenagers can eat. You know, when they were little, you could get those little meals they could share. But now, you're, they're eating huge adult-sized meals, right? So, of course, that, it's costly, and I remember we had just had a major ministry week, and the kids, they run hard with us. I mean, our kids are ministry marathon runners. I mean, like, kids their age don't run the way they run. Um, and so Glenn and I are like, you know what? We're going to go to Zippy's. Let's go to Zippy's. And for us, Zippy's is a treat because to eat, take a family of seven to Zippy's, that ain't cheap. Uh, that's a lot of money, especially because they're eating the expensive stuff. They're not just getting chili cheese fries anymore. <laughs> That ain't, they ain't going to do it. You know, sign in, that don't satisfy no more. So they got to have the hearty meals, right? And so we're sitting there, we're having fellowship, and we're eating. And then I don't know who it was to this day. I, I, I don't know who it was. 
Um, but we went to go pay for our bill, and it had to have been at least $80, $90, you know. Um, and the waitress said, oh, you don't got to pay for your bill. I said, well, we didn't pay for it yet. And she said, I know that somebody else paid for it. They told me not to tell you who it was. They walked out already, and they paid for your meal. They said, whatever it is, put it on this card. They didn't even wait to find out what the dollar amount was. And we as a family, I, I get emotional thinking about it. We as a family sat there just stunned. And immediately our response was, I need to do this. I need to be this kind of goodness to the world. It completely changed my compass. I, I was like, you know, Lord, if I could be financially successful in such a way that dropping hundreds of dollars every day for somebody else's meal, I, I, will, I want that. Not because I want to be wealthy, but it is my greatest desire to go into a restaurant, find the biggest family there, and go pay their bill and add on dessert. By the way, can you get them a whole cake, whatever one they want, put it on the bill? That's, it completely transformed me. This has happened to Glenn and I two or three times now. So I told Glenn, I'm like, you know what? We're going to start doing this. We can't do it at that caliber, but we can start doing it. I remember a couple came into the restaurant we were at. We knew them. We knew that it was their birthday. So Glenn said, you know what? We're going we're gonna to pay for the bill. Shh. So he's all ninja-like. He's like, you, you see that couple over there? Try wait till we leave, okay? But we want, we want you to put the bill. We want to cover it. Can you just put it on the card? And she looked at us like we were weird because she, she didn't speak English very well too, yeah? Because uh, we were in a Korean restaurant. And she's like, y y you want to pay for them? Yeah, yeah, I want to pay for our meal and I want to pay for their meal. And he's trying to be quiet, right, because it was a small restaurant. And so he, we did. And it, we tried to keep it anonymous, but because it was such a small restaurant, I think that person figured it out. But it felt so good to give, right? So we're learning that when you encounter Jesus and you experience his goodness, it should cause you to want to do something. Like, you can't help it, Right? And so, how do we cultivate, a, 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 how do we nurture a heart that's, that can give thanks, that can just be generous in their thanksgiving? Well, encounter Jesus daily. You can encounter him here, but how many of you know, the way we encountered Jesus this morning in worship, he, you can encounter him in your bathroom like that. You can encounter him in a car. You can encounter him in the park. You, you can encounter him at the grocery store like that. We just don't choose to look for those opportunities to encounter him like that. Amen. So, number one, we want to encounter Jesus daily. Number two, write in your notes, in all things give thanks. In all things give thanks. Okay? And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Okay. The only thing I want to say here is that this scripture is not a recommendation. Okay? It is a command. Okay, if you study the English language, you could say, you give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Jesus is not suggesting it. Jesus is not recommending it. Jesus is not saying you have a choice as to whether you're going to do it or not. We have a choice because we have free will. But his intention is for you to hear his word and obey Okay, now, the only other thing I want to say about this point is this. A lot of people struggle with this scripture because they're like, well, how can I give thanks when I'm like completely in debt and I have no food to feed my children? How do I give thanks when I go see my family and I see the man who molested me when I was five years old? How do I give thanks um, to the fact that someone just stole my car, right? N nod your head if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, this is very important. I want you to circle the word in. God does not command us to give thanks for all circumstances. God commands us to give thanks in it. For example, a brother was coming to our church, and I was blown away by this man's faith. This is how I knew he had been encountering Jesus daily, because you're not going to be able to do this if you don't have Jesus on the inside of you, and you don't have him um, nurturing your heart. Um, 
he calls us and he says, pastors, I'm not going to be able to come to church. I said, oh, brother, what happened? He said, somebody stole my truck. I, someone stole my truck. He wasn't upset. He wasn't mad. He's like, but I'm okay. I'm just praising God. I'm just praising God that obviously the enemy thinks I'm worthy enough to mess with, so he sent somebody to send, so steal my truck. Right? And the Bible teaches us that. If you're struggling, if things are coming against you, count it joy that you are worthy enough to be struggling for the kingdom of God. Right? So that's how you give thanks in it. You don't got to give thanks for it. There's nothing right about a grown man molesting a little child. But we can rejoice and give thanks in that situation because we know that God is the restorer of all life. God is the healer of our souls. So whatever violation happened in that moment, we know that in Christ, he can take it away and completely bring healing and wholeness back to that person. I can give thanks for that. Because in the midst of darkness and evil, he is still good. And he is working everything out for our good. Can I get an amen? It is a different perspective. It is going from the glass is half empty to the glass is half full. Now, I was a person that was a glass half empty person. So I've had to learn to nurture a heart of thankfulness. I've had to learn to, to nurture an attitude that will see positive. Because I instinctually can see the negative. That's just naturally who, who I am because that's how I was raised. I can see a beautiful portrait painted. And I don't see the beautiful portrait. I just see the spot down there that is discolored. Because I focus on the one little thing that's negative. So I had to allow for Jesus to change my heart and help me to see the beauty and the goodness that was around me and not just keep reflecting on the negative things. And when I did that, then I could give thanks in all things. Amen? How many of you know that when you're at your worst place, when you're feeling miserable, when you're like down and depressed and angry, if you can start to just give thanks unto God, he can completely turn your demeanor around. Amen? I can't tell you how many times I've been so angry. Um, I mean, literally, t moments before church, I, uh, somebody just came and vomited all over me. I'm just like, oh, my gosh. And now you want me to serve these people? You know, like, I'm, like, fighting with God in the bathroom. So if I'm in there for a long time, I'm not constipated. I'm having a moment with Jesus. And I'm like, they just attacked me, and I'm trying to love everybody. And you want me to love people, God? And I'm, like, mad. I'm, like, ready to say, I don't want to do this anymore. Find somebody else, you know. And I'm having this pity party, and I know I'm in my flesh because, you know, love doesn't take offense. So I ain't walking in love in that moment I'm because I'm totally offended. I'm, like, oh, my gosh, Teresa, deal with yourself. And then I would just shut my eyes. In the, I'm in the bathroom, and I just start thanking God. I just start praising him. I find those go-to worship songs, and I just start worshiping God. And he changes my heart, completely changes my heart. He does it to David all the time. King David, go read the book of Psalms. The man seems manic depressant. Like he's cursing his enemies and like just negative, negative. Halfway through the psalm, he's like, but Lord, you are great and mighty and good. I love the book of Psalms. I'm thinking, I'm okay. I'm just like David. And David was a man after God's own heart. I'm okay. You're okay. It's okay when you have those moments of flesh. What's not okay is what you choose to do with it. Now, in that moment of my flesh, I could come back out of the bathroom and I could just rip a new one on that person who went off on me. And how is that showing forth God's light and mercy and his kindness and his goodness? That's not, right? I had to let God deal with me. So that he could get my heart back to where it needs to be. I know that I'm growing because now, okay, now as a pastor, I've never had to go to the bathroom and get right with Jesus. Even if someone totally vomited all over me. And it's happened. I've had people come accuse me of things in this church. I've had people be upset with me because I supposedly did something that I didn't even know I did. I'm like, I, I did that. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't think I did that. And instead of responding in offense, I responded in compassion. I'm like, oh, okay, hallelujah. Instead of having a heart in heart, I maintained a soft heart. And I maintain a heart of gratefulness. I'm grateful that I have the privilege to be a pastor here at Haliva. To me, Haleiwa campus is the greatest campus that ever walked the planet. I'm like, I've been to lots of campuses. I'm like, our campus is amazing. 
Turn to your neighbor and say, we have an amazing campus. Turn to your other neighbor and say, they don't know it yet, but I think we're God's favorite. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope you think like that, you know, get giddy, get bubbly, I, like just be full of joy and gratefulness and thankfulness. I mean, like we got to not complain and murmur and be like, what was us? I mean, you know what? Let's be thankful. We get to clean windows today. You know, why I'm excited because we have windows to clean. Four years ago, we never have a church building. Now we have this one. Do I want to focus on that? We don't have air conditioning some days. <sighs> But I'm learning to just, Teresa, be thankful. God will get you your air conditioning. God will do what he's going to do. Can I get an amen? Okay. But unfortunately, today's society, we're so entitled. Right? Pastor Mike was telling me about how in the news, there's a revolution happening in colleges. And there are on college campuses today, students are demanding free tuition. Did anybody see that in the news? I, I was like stunned. People are demanding free tuition. They expect that they should get free tuition as, as a matter of fact, the taxpayer should pay for my tuition. I'm like, okay, excuse me, I'm a taxpayer, and if I can't pay for my kids to go to college, I surely ain't going to pay for yours. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> but we live in a society where everybody wants something. They, it, they want it, they expect it, they're entitled to it. We need to cultivate a heart that is entitled to nothing. We deserve nothing. As a matter of fact, we deserve God's worst. And what did he do? He gave us his best. And when you understand that truth, you don't walk around entitled. You walk around in humility going, I don't deserve the goodness of God. I have to do something. Lord, I, my life is yours. It is not my own. You bought me with a price. You tell me what you want me to do. I'm going to live for your glory. Even when it costs me something. Right? Right? I got three or four hours of sleep last night. My family was hammered this morning. I was like, oh, praise Jesus. It's going to be a good day. We're going to roll in the supernatural today. <laughs> Hallelujah. And sometimes we need to get to that place. We need to get to a place where there is nothing left of you. Because then real ministry takes place. Can I get an amen? amen? I think that's why it was so powerful this morning, man. Because we were just all in the glory realm together. Like, there is no flesh. The flesh is, like, still sleeping in my bed at home. All I got is the spirit of God today. You know, and I think God's saying, hallelujah, finally, okay, we can do some work now. Let's go, right? And so that is the heart we want to nurture, that heart of thankfulness that look, we deserve God's words and we got his best. It will cause us to move out of our comfort zone. Amen? Psalm 136 verse 1 says it like this. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. And whenever you're having a struggling day or whenever you're feeling grumpy or whenever you're feeling moody or whenever you're feeling complaining or whatever it is, pull out this scripture and say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. My situation is not good. My circumstances suck, but that's all right. God, I give thanks to you because in the midst of all this scubula, I know you are good. Amen. Amen? In the midst of everybody just vomiting on me or accusing me or backstabbing me or my boss is doing this or it's all just nasty. You know, when you're at the store, you're just trying to have a peaceful day of shopping and people are pushing and shoving you because they want that last TV that's on sale. You stop and you say, Lord, I give thanks to you for you are good. This chaos, this madness, this ain't good. But you are good. Hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus. Right? So put that scripture up around you so that you don't let the struggles of this life cause you to get bitter and disheartened and grumpy and grumbling. Because if we just only look at our circumstances, we're never going to give thanks. That's why it says, the Bible says, fix your eyes on me. If you fix your eyes on me, then you're going to be able to be, have a heart of thankfulness. Amen? Sometimes we just need to take our eyes off of ourselves and put them on other people, and then we won't be so bogged down by the trials of our own life. We will be filled with God's love, compassion, joy, kindness, because we're serving other people. So lastly, how do we nurture a heart that gives thanks? First, you encounter Jesus daily. Second, in all things, give thanks. And lastly, would you write, serve, give, and love others. 
Serve, give, and love others. I can't tell you how many times when I'm in a bad mood or I'm in a bad space, serving God and God's people has been my saving grace. I have weeks that were just horrific. But I knew that I could come to church and I had the honor and the privilege to come to church. And the moment I start serving God's people and I start serving him, all of that goes away. And I am once again in God's perfect will for my life. And I experience his perfect peace. I experience his perfect joy. I experience his perfect love because I'm not thinking about woe is me. I am just serving God's people. And I think that if we can learn that from Zacchaeus because that's what he did. In Luke chapter 19, verse 8, it says, Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. At the close of Zacchaeus' story, he was moved by his encounter by, with Jesus. So much so that it prompted him to give half his possessions away. And to even make right the wrongs that he had done by giving four times back. It's like he, he, he wronged these people. He stole from them. He's like, I'm not only going to give you what I stole from you. I'm going to give you interest. And that's what encountering Jesus daily does for us. That's what giving thanks in all things does for us. It nurtures this heart that is full of gratitude and praise and thanksgiving. That it causes you to want to make wrong things right. It causes you to be a person that if you find out you wronged somebody, even if it was unintentional, you want to go make it right with them. I, I have so many stories that I could tell about how I said something and I didn't mean for it to come out that way, but it came out that way and they misunderstood me. And so a person was offended. I found out about it. Immediately I'm on the phone saying, we gotta, I, I'm sorry. That wasn't my intention. Please forgive me. Okay, and that's because I'm encountering Jesus daily. It's because I'm so grateful for what he's given me that I don't deserve, that I am, I am quick to give back all of the forgiveness that God has given me. I'm quick to just give that back and to ask for that from others. Where in today's church, far too many people hold on to grudges. They hold on to hurt. They hold on to anger. They hold on to bitterness. And God is saying, don't do that because you're only destroying you. You're not destroying anybody else. You're destroying you. I want you to cultivate a heart that gives thanks, a heart that will love and serve and give others. Why? Not because I need you to, because you need to. Because when you do that, you're transformed. You're full of God's mercy. You're full of God's presence. You're walking in his perfect will. You are never more one with Christ than when you are serving like Christ served. You are never more one with Christ than when you're sacrificing the way Christ sacrificed. That's what it means when Jesus said his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. Lord, let them be one with one another as you are one with me. Let them be one with you. The whole point is that we are, yes, the body of Christ, but we can experience oneness, a unity, a synergy, a connectedness that is powerful beyond our understanding when we connect to the heart of the Father and we cultivate the heart that Jesus had. For Jesus came to serve and not to be served. And so if you want to be that person that not just in Thanksgiving, not just, you know, I, I've been praying about this. I, we don't want thanks, Thanksgiving and this, this, um, this culture of Thanksgiving to just happen because it's November and November is Thanksgiving month. You know, my daughter was telling me, Mom, we should be thankful every day. I said, I agree. So you know what we're going to do? We're not going to take the tree down. Honestly, I, I, I'm okay with leaving up the Thanksgiving twig tree all year round. So we are reminded that we are constantly to be in a perpetual state of Thanksgiving. And when you do that, you watch the blessings that will abound in your life. As you serve and give and, and love on other people, you are going to be more blessed than what you're trying to give out. I, I can say that because when we got our free dinner that person blessed us with, I remember how much joy and blessing I felt, but it didn't even measure to what I felt when we blessed somebody else. It's to the, I'm, a, I'm addicted now to it. 
seriously, I'm like, how many people can I just go randomly bless? I, just the other day, I sat down next to Glenn. We were sitting down and we were just, you know, we, we dream build together. We, we talk story. And I said, honey, you realize you married a very generous woman, right? <laughs> he said, yes, I, I know that. I said, okay, I just want you to know because when we come into some money, I'm going to give a lot of money away. I, I just need you to know how much money I want to give away. And he just smiled and it blessed me because my husband wasn't nervous about it. Like, <laughs> The look on his face was he was so filled with joy that he had married a woman that had that heart. That I wasn't into the money because I wanted a Gucci bag or a coach bag or I wanted, I don't want any of that stuff. I want to drop hundreds of the dollars anytime God tells me to drop it. And he just looked so proud of me. Like, God, I got to make a lot of money. <laughs> I, I know that's, that's what he was thinking. Like, man, God, you got to help me out because you, you gave me a generous woman, so you got to bring finances so she can, she can do what you created her to do. And I, I dream about what we're going to do on the North Shore. I'm just like, you know, God, what, the enemy needs to watch out when I come into some money. <laughs> I am going to rock the North Shore with some money because that's my heart. And, and that's not my heart naturally. That is my heart that God has cultivated in me. Because as I stand in his presence every day, as I give thanks to him, even in the, the junk of life, as I go out and serve his people when I don't want to, he just overflows me with his love and his goodness and his faithfulness to me. And then I get all these people coming to me saying, you don't know how much you impacted my life. I'm like, that is the Lord. And I stand in, a, in, in the presence of Almighty God and I'm like, what did I, could I have ever done that you would choose me to be the mouthpiece of our Lord? What ha, could I have ever, I couldn't have done any of that. I don't deserve this ministry. I don't deserve to be surrounded by such amazing people. And the more people that keep coming, I'm like, God, you keep bringing such amazing people to this campus. I don't, we don't deserve that. And I am so overwhelmed that it, it causes me to want to figure out what can I do to give back? What can I do to serve? What can I do to, to sow more into God's kingdom? You can't outgive God. The more you give him, the more he gives you. And you're like, oh, I got to do more. And it's just a cycle of giving and thankfulness and giving and thankfulness. So I want to encourage you. There are so many opportunities coming up to give. You can do give thanks. If Thursday for Thanksgiving is too hard for you, don't feel condemnation. Don't feel that. You go be with your family if that's what you need to do. If, if it's a tradition for you to do it, go do that. Do not feel condemned because you can't do give thanks. Because you know what? Give thanks doesn't happen just on Thanksgiving Day. It should be 365 days of giving thanks, of giving and serving and loving. So maybe you're not going to show up on Thursday, but maybe you're going to do something on Friday. Or maybe you're going to do something next week, Wednesday. I don't know what it is. Um, but just find opportunities to just be a person that nurtures the heart of thankfulness that is a giving person, which is why it says thanksgiving. Give out of your thankfulness, right? We have the Angel Tree Project. If you've never done Angel Tree, I want to encourage you to do it. If you have children, I especially want to encourage you to do it. Because when you take your children to the store and you take that angel card and it's a little boy of seven years old and you go shopping for a toy and you ask your son, hey, son, let's go find something that a seven-year-old would love. And he's thinking, oh, I'm around seven. Maybe mommy and daddy are going to buy me something. And he, buys, he looks for the greatest, coolest gift that you can get for a seven-year-old because he's thinking, oh, mom and dad are going to get me this from Christmas. And then you say, oh, okay, we're going to give this now to the little boy at Holly Eva Elementary School who doesn't have any money and they're not going to have Christmas unless we give them a gift. And then watch God use that to change your child's heart. To get them, because children are naturally selfish. We were all selfish. And it's an opportunity to teach your child now how to nurture a heart of thanksgiving and to give. Can't, we're going to get one less gift for you, son, and we're going to give a gift away. Right? So we have angel tree going on. We have the give tra thanks tree back there. We're going to do campus cleanup today. There's so many things that are going to be coming up. And you don't have to wait for the church corporately to plan things. You just be that. Like I said, wake up every day and intentionally go add value to somebody's life. They'll be surprised. If you talk to them, call them by name and tell them how awesome they're doing. Because they're not hearing that from their bosses. They're not hearing that from their coworkers. You know? So you go out and be that light of Christ. Amen? We
With that, I just want to close in prayer. Would you stand to your feet? With every eye closed and every head bowed. If you're here this morning and you've never given your heart to the Lord and had an encounter with him that touched you deeply in your heart, if that's you here this morning, would you raise your hand? We want to pray for you. If you're here this morning and you know Jesus and you fell away and you started living life your own way, but you want to come back to him and you want to rededicate your life to him with every eye closed and every head bowed, if that's you here today, would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you. If you're here this morning and maybe you realize that you can grow in becoming a person that nurtures a heart of thankfulness, a heart that's full of gratitude, and you want to be that person that will go out and love and serve and be the light of Christ and extend God's love, his mercy, his compassion, his grace to others. If that's you here this morning, would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you as well. Hallelujah. Would you repeat this after me? Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy, for your kindness, for your goodness, for your love. I know that I don't deserve any of it. And I'm so grateful that you loved me when I was unlovable, that you accepted me when I was unacceptable. And I now offer my heart up to you that you would change it, that you would soften it, and that you would mold it into the heart of Christ, that I would have a heart full of thanksgiving, that I would have a generous heart, that I would have a servant heart, just as Jesus did. Thank you, Father, that I don't have to change myself. Thank you that daily I surrender to you, you will change me for your greater glory. It's in your son's name we pray all these things. And all of God's children said, amen and amen and amen.